So we are, um, we are uh, going to um, finish our series that we've been doing on uh, the uh, mountains of God that we've encountered over uh, the past few months. And so uh, I thought this would be a, a great place for us to end. And the original plan had been uh, to, to finish with uh, the Mount of uh, Calvary. And then I thought, actually, I don't really want to preach on Mount Calvary on, uh, on Easter Sunday, because like, that was Friday, and this is Sunday. And as Tony Campolo said, Friday is there, but uh, Sunday is coming. And so we want to celebrate the Sunday moment. And so I wrestled with that today uh, or, or this week about, well, how, how, how might we do that? And uh, I don't know if you heard when Joan uh, read for us, but, but Jesus, he, in, he tells his disciples to go to uh, Galilee and there they will meet him. And what's uh, important there is that when we actually get to meet them, and I'm just going to read the last little section of Matthew 28 here for us, uh, Jesus, as Joan read, said, go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Then it says later, then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so here is this uh, Matthew's account of the resurrection, and it finishes on a mountain, uh, Jesus with his disciples. And it's an unnamed mountain in Galilee. Um, some people have suggested that this mountain might be Mount Tabor, uh, however, it is unlikely, I think, to be Mount Tabor. It's much more likely that what Matthew means is that this is the kind of unnamed, the hills of Galilee, if you like. Um, the Sea of Galilee sits there and it is surrounded on uh, all sides by uh, hills, by fairly sizable hills. And the reason I think it's that is because Matthew begins his gospel in the hills around Galilee and he ends his gospel in the hills around Galilee. And so there's this sense of a beginning and an ending to his story, that it matters for him that the place that all of this began is where his story is ending. And this is where all the disciples were from. And so what's happened is that they've been in Jerusalem, and if we know the other stories of the resurrection, we know that Jesus encountered uh, his 11 disciples, but also many others, over the course of a few weeks. And we know that this is one of them. And they would have had to have traveled from Jerusalem, where most of these encounters take place, where um, uh, where the, the, the crucifixion took place, and they would have to travel up to Galilee, about 60 kilometers. It's not an insubstantial journey. It's three or four days of travel with this expectation of obedience and going to meet Jesus. Can you imagine the conversations they had on the road? I mean, we don't know, right? It's not in the scriptures, but but this is 11 guys, and, and we, this is one of those occasions where it may well just have been the 11 of them, and they travel for a few days, traveling north, and you can imagine the kinds of conversations that were going on. Like, guys, is, is this madness? It's, it, it's a 60-kilometer walk. It's boiling hot. And, like, he died. Like, he really did die. And I know we've kind of heard and seen, but is this the right thing? Should we not just... Or maybe, maybe the, among them was the disciple who met Jesus on the road to Emmaus. Maybe they're there, and, and the Emmaus roads perhaps already happened. We don't quite know the chronology of that, but perhaps that's already happened. They said, no, look, let me tell you about that Bible study that this guy who walked alongside us told us all about, and, and it, it, it helps us see. And so they start telling the stories of what they've done with Jesus over the last three years. Thomas is among them. Maybe this is after Thomas has touched Jesus' wounds and touched 
his side. And he's walking, and he said, it was real. Like, I, I really did touch his hands. And I, like, I, I, I don't know. It, maybe this is after John 21, and, and there's a sense of uh, Peter having been restored, and, and, and they're talking there. That, that fish thing he does where we, we fish all night, and then he turns up and all the fish are there. Like, like if, if he's alive, maybe he could do a bit more of that. My business will run great. Maybe these are the conversations that were happening. The one thing I'm sure they were saying is, what's going to happen now? What, what's next? He, he's alive, but like, I, I, I don't really know what happens next. Because like, people don't come back from the dead, right? That's, they, they die, and then we mourn, and then we move on. Well, what do you do when they come back to life? Because that's confusing, and so they get to Galilee, and Jesus reveals himself, it says, and then the text says this, and they bowed down in worship. This is a moment of massive change. You see, they knew Jesus as a rabbi, their teacher, okay? And so they, they followed him around Israel for, for three years, learning from him. They, they, they knew him as, as the teacher, the one who'd given them all this incredible teaching on the Sermon on the Mount and elsewhere. They knew him as a great prophet. They knew him as a great wonder worker. But all of those things are just things that give him some power and some authority. None of them make him God. And yet here, these orthodox Jewish men come to a man and they bow down in worship because their eyes have been opened and now that they see that this man is not just an ordinary man who could do amazing things, they suddenly understand all the stuff that they saw that this man is indeed God himself and the resurrection proves it and they recognize his divinity and they worship. This is the good news. You see the cross and Jesus' death and all that it represents, the violence and the idolatry and the abuse of power has been thrown down. That's why our cross is on its side because it's a picture of what are we going to see. It's been thrown down and by Jesus' resurrection, He is revealed as God. He is to be worshipped, not just listened to as a teacher, challenged by as a prophet or followed like a rabbi. He's to be worshipped. This is the good news of Easter. This is the story. Jesus is alive and He is God. The end. You know, go home now. That was good. Is that it? Well, yes, but it's not all that's in our story. Our text this morning has this little verse. And I've mentioned it here a few times before, but I've never had the chance to actually preach on it. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. There are 11 of them there. The text's really clear. This isn't, oh, the 11 of them were super holy and they worshipped and all these followers on, they doubted. Now, this is 11 men who will quite literally change the face of the world with all that's going to happen. They are stood before their, their Lord, who was dead and is now alive. They worship, but some doubt. And I absolutely love the Bible for those few words. Because I tell you what, if I was writing the Bible, well, first of all, the grammar would be terrible, but um, if, I, if I was writing the Bible, I would not put that in. It's complicated. It's like, what, what's going on? No, they worshipped, they celebrated, they had a great time, they had a feast, they worshipped God and, and on and on. Right? That's what I would write. But no, Matthew takes the time to note for us and some doubt it. And I think that's good news for us. Because I don't know about you, there's a real temptation, and we've done some of it this morning, 
to Easter Sunday is all about joy and all about celebration, and we have to celebrate all that's good, all the new life that's coming. We've got these lovely daffodils uh, all around the building. Uh, you will be offered some to take home later, because if we leave them here, they'll not be lovely daffodils next week. They'll be dead, and somebody will have to clean them up. Instead, they can brighten up your home as a gift of new life to you. And we want to do those things and celebrate, and we'll hang about after church, and we'll have coffee, and we'll encourage one another, and we'll build one, and that's all great. But I know, and you know, that just to be in that place of excitement and passion all the time, it's not real because life crashes in, right? And it becomes difficult. And I know some of you, say, there's nothing prophetic about this. I know the circumstances of some of you in this room and it's difficult. Life has been hard. Life is painful. And so to just come and say, oh, I am filled with joy this morning means parking your actual life outside the front doors of the church. And that can't be right. But it's okay, friends, because some doubted. Let's think about that for a moment. I, I decided this week to go back and read all the resurrection texts from all the gospels and look at what are the emotions that people express. And I thought I was going to find all these people saying, and they rejoiced greatly, and it was wonderful. But the good news is, I didn't. Um, not even a little bit was that all that was there. The first one we see, also in Matthew's gospel, fear. The guards at the tomb, the Marys when they encounter the angels, it does say they were also filled with joy at the same time, but they were startled and frightened, Luke records. In Mark 16, when the women go to enter the tomb, he records that they were alarmed. And so one of the main emotions that seems to be around Jesus and his uh, uh, post-resurrection uh, appearances uh, is fear. People react in fear and alarm, which is pretty reasonable because dead people don't come back to life, do they? You know, if dead people started wandering around your house at night, I suspect fear and alarm might be at the front end of your experience. Another one, though, is confusion. In Mark 16, the women are bewildered. In Mark 16, it carries on, and the men, the, the women were bewildered, but the men didn't believe it. There may be a sermon in there somewhere, but I'm not going anywhere near it. Luke 24, the women were wondering. Peter wondered to himself what had happened. And in John 20, it simply says they did not understand. There's a confusion that surrounds the resurrection of Jesus. It's simply not clear what's going on. They don't have a brain space for a dead person now being an alive person. A third emotion, doubt. Luke 24, doubts arise in their minds. Famously, Thomas in John 20, who I think really harshly gets stuck with this for the rest of history because he is, of course, doubting Thomas. Except he is the one, the first one, who actually gets it. Because once he sees Jesus himself, he says, my Lord and my God. And so I think he should be called Faithful Thomas, but I'm never going to change that one because that is, uh, we're stuck with doubting Thomas. So we have, uh, that's a second one. And then of course our text today also talks about doubt. The last one is disappointment. Um, the disciples on the road to Emmaus are described as downcast. They're disappointed. And Peter in John 21, I think it's reasonable to assume his going back to fishing is a disappointment with the whole thing. Yes, Jesus is alive, but well, I, well what do you do with that? I don't know. I'm going fishing. I'm going to go back to what I knew. I'm going to trust, my, trust that rather than anything else. So there is some joy around, but it's complicated joy because it's mixed up with fear and alarm and confusion and doubt and disappointment. And I feel like that's good news to me. I don't know about you, 
because it creates a space for me where I don't just have to think this is all brilliant and I, I just accept it as it is and, and I am filled with great joy. Actually, the complexity of my life can come into that. Is that good news for anyone else? Well, I'm preaching for the both of us then. That's good. We're Let's go back to our doubt word for a moment. It's a strange word. It appears only twice in the Gospels, uh, both times in the Gospel of Matthew. It's uh, a Greek word. I will tell you what it is, and that way I've justified the money I spent on my theological education. Uh, distatso is the word. Uh, it's a strange word. It doesn't appear much. It doesn't appear at all in the Septuagint, and that's the uh, Greek Old Testament. Um, and it doesn't appear a great deal anywhere else either, but it, do, it is reasonably translated as doubt. One person described it as this, and I think this is really helpful for us, that this doubt word really means the disorientation produced by an unfamiliar and overwhelming situation. Let me say that again. The disorientation produced by an unfamiliar and overwhelming situation. I think dead people being alive easily classifies itself as an unfamiliar and overwhelming situation. And it produces a disorientation. This is what the doubt is being talked about. Where's the other example, you might ask? Matthew chapter 14. Jesus, catching up with his disciples, decides to catch up with them by walking across the water, as you do. Um, they can't quite see who it is. Peter thinks it's the Lord. He says, Lord, if it's you, call me to you. And Jesus says, come. So Peter gets down out of the boat and he starts to walk towards Jesus. So get this, he's walking on the water. He's doing this thing. But after some distance, we don't know quite how far, the wind blows and the storms come up and, it, and Peter begins to sink. And Jesus comes to Peter and says, why did you distart so? Why did you doubt? To which if I was Peter, I'd be saying, have you seen the wind and the waves and I'm walking on water? That's not supposed to happen. This is an unfamiliar and overwhelming situation. I am walking on waves. That's a good song, but when you do it in real life, it's got to be a bit freaky. It produced a disorientation in Peter. He begins to sink. Jesus lifts him back up again. And then be sure to notice this. He, he's rebuked by Jesus for his lack of faith or his doubt. But then they walk back to the boat again. Peter walked on water twice. Right? He walked out and he walked back again. It's awesome. This is the doubt that comes. This sense that... The, all these things going on produces this sense of disorientation. And so in the midst of worship, we doubt. And so don't worry if we find ourselves with a mixture of emotions this morning. Yes, we rejoice. Jesus is alive. The world is not the same as it was. And yet I experience a disorientation because we still have masks on. We still are experiencing something of a pandemic. We see wars in Europe. Many of us will have personal lives that have real challenges. Some of us will have had the, the blessing, no, we'll go with curse, of our gas bill dropping on the, the doorstep. Like, it produces a disorientation. And what do we do with that? Do we just acknowledge it and say, oh, well, I guess that's the best we can hope for? No, I, I think there are some things we can do. In fact, things I think we must do. Yes, we must acknowledge the reality that among us we might doubt. But Jesus then commissions these 11 to go. And they do go and they change the world. He provides the power of his resurrection. He, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. And therefore, because that is true, go. And so I think that's a challenge for us because it's really tempting to think, well, 
I'll tell people about Jesus once I understand it all. Once I can go to Easter Sunday service and just stand there in awe that Jesus is alive and have no disorientation caused by my overwhelming circumstances. Once I've squared all that away, then I could do something. That's not what Jesus does. He takes this 11 of which some doubted and he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, you go and we'll change the world. And they do. And, and this is the amazing thing, because I bet those ones who doubted, in fact, let's just be honest, all of them there, bar John, were martyred. Okay, so no matter how their doubt was, something overcame that. And the biggest thing that overcomes doubt is just going and doing. You know, if, if you doubt that God heals, start praying for people to be healed. And when He heals, then you'll be like, well, okay. If, if you doubt that Jesus still saves people today, start telling people about Jesus and watch what happens. If, if you doubt that Jesus can really meet you in that place of pain or, or, or that, that sin that's had its grip of you for so long, then bring it to Him and see what happens. God will prove Himself because that's what He does. And in that way, the proof is in the pudding. This is not some intellectual idea you assent to, but something you have experienced. It's, in the Scottish vernacular, it's better felt than tell, right? That you experience it rather than be told about it. Or as one of our old pastors used to say, he said, you need to know in your knower. You need to know in your knower that this is true. And it only comes by experiencing it. It's not to say we shouldn't think. It's not to say that we shouldn't do those things. You know me. That, that, those things are important. But we must also experience something of this reality. The good news of Easter is a new kingdom coming, a king revealed, and a community of complicated followers worshiping with what they know, trusting what has been revealed, and wrestling with the rest, keeping our eyes on him as Peter did as he walked on the water and recognizing that Jesus is alive and therefore nothing is the same. See, the only reasonable explanation of the growth of the church from this mountain in Galilee with 11 disciples plus Jesus, some of whom doubted, that's it, right? That's pretty much the church. There were some others, a couple of hundred maybe in total that had stuck around, but that's it. Today, 2.4 billion people in the world are going to celebrate Easter Sunday. One in three people on the planet would say they belong to the Christian faith. There were 11 of them, and some of them doubted. There's no other reasonable explanation than Jesus really is alive, because otherwise, it was just 11 guys who thought, oh, well, we give it a go. 2.4 billion today. Friends, Jesus is alive. The proof is in the pudding. The world has been turned upside down and changed because He is alive. And so how do we deal with this disorientation we experience? Well, we help one another with it too. It's not just the proof is in the pudding. What do we do when we've got those moments of doubt? Well, some among them doubted, and they all together worshipped. That's how we do it. We gather on a Sunday. The times to come are the times you really don't want to come. And you maybe can't sing the songs, but let others sing the songs for you. Maybe you can't lift up your hands and worship, but be encouraged that others can. Maybe you don't have the faith to pray for healing right now, but maybe you could ask someone to pray for you. Because this is the point. We are the body of Christ. And we're supposed to minister and hold one another and encourage one another. We build one another up and we create space for Jesus to demonstrate His goodness. And when Jesus shows up to demonstrate His goodness, might we have the courage, like Thomas, to go from those who are disoriented by unfamiliar circumstances 
to saying, my Lord and my God. Friends, as the rest of this year plays out before us, with all the many things that are going on, all the things we will have to face, all the challenges that we will have, might we know the presence of the risen Jesus with us? Because if there's us and G the risen Jesus with us, 11 people becomes 2.4 billion. Our little church can bless Portobello more than we will ever know if we are willing to live into, with faith, the reality that Jesus is alive and it will change our lives.